Hello everyone, welcome to another discussion of the White Luck Warrior. This is the second book of the Aspect Emperor series, or the fifth book of the second apocalypse series by R. Scott Baker. Uh, we are reading this book approximately a sixth at a time. Uh, today we are going to be discussing chapters seven through nine. With me I have the usual group of friends. Carl, would you like to start us off with introductions? Yeah, my name is... Carl Albert. I'm the first time reader of the series uh, and obsessed with this book. <laughs> and I'm Steve, and it's my second time reading. And it's, I don't know, I, I like, I have a, a love hate relationship with this book, but it's, <laughs> it's still good. Just by the standards of the series, it's not my favorite. What's your favorite in this last quadrilogy, this last set of books? The last one. Oh, okay. Okay. Exciting. Okay. Cool. Interesting. I thought these three chapters were fascinating. I there were so many parts that wowed me in ways that I think the first book did the first series didn't. The scale of the uh battles that we saw, I think it was in chapter seven, right? With the shrank, the descriptions of how they covered the entire landscape that there was no horizon because they were filled with shrank. I loved those descriptions and they had a bit of repetition, you know, like Blood Meridian style, if you will, but they were so effective and they were absolutely brilliant. I've talked so many times about how I hate action scenes, but these were so effective. Even I couldn't check out <laughs> during these scenes. Um, yeah, they were, they were brilliant. So many things that wowed me in these set of chapters. And I wanted to pose this question like is it okay can we start on that shrank yeah. battle yeah um i've i feel like this whole cannon fodder business is interesting like uh they make for to me one of the reasons that i figured out why i like these battle scenes a bit more is because on the one side we have shrank and then the other side we still have the naming of all the uh different groups and so on but the cannon fodder aspect of the shrank made it for a fun battle versus, oh my God, so many people are dying. So I could check out that aspect of it and just enjoy the battle. I, uh, did you guys find that too? Or is it, is it just me? You know, I, I don't know. I, I would really have to like sit back and think to figure out, because I also enjoyed this battle more than I have a lot of the other battles, just in terms of like the actual play by play. I think... On one hand, it was easier for me to follow in a big sense, you know, I, I don't I don't know why that is. If it was the repetition, if it was kind of the simplicity of like the the shrank are just sort of hoarding, you know, onto the army. Um and you know, they're split off, uh they're humans, but like it it I don't know, it was easier to follow than a lot of the other uh battles, particularly in the first trilogy were. Um I, I definitely think I mean, it, I, just in terms of just like the raw feel of the battle, this may be my favorite. You know, like like I, I the the only other one that I really stood out to me in the same way was sort of the the very final battle, the battle of um, Ishwal, uh, not Ishwal, um, Shimei, right? Yeah, Shimei. Thank you. Um, in the thousandfold thought, I. I you know, that one I struggled to follow at times, but like there was a clear sort of dramatic journey there and you, you got the feeling of how epic it was. And there was a lot of like twists and turns within the battle itself. And, you know, you also got these kind of more intimate glimpses with like Proyas, for example, who you also get here. And I, I just, yeah, I thought it was awesome the way it ended everything um, with Sirwa and Sorwheel. Um, which are two very unfortunately close names, uh, especially because Sorwheel's nickname is is Sorwa, isn't it, or something like that? Yeah, it's like Baker. Come on, get, get, give us some some slack here. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, this was really amazing, and yeah, it was just like a real cinematic, emotional experience. And, I, and I, I'm with you that it that it definitely kind of reminded me of some of the um, battles in Blood Meridian, although certainly taken to a whole nother scale. I mean, this is beyond, like, this is the most epic of epic fantasy, you know, like thousands upon thousands of people colliding. Uh, it was, yeah, it was awesome. 
So I'm trying to figure out how they'll get out of this because the way I'm picturing it, and I think this is right, it's not just in my head, there's this like small circle, the great ordeal for all its vastness where Sorvi once noticed that he's looking to the horizon and the army is going that long or that far, it's still the great ordeal. For all its vastness, is surrounded on every side by the shrank. So how are they possibly going to get out of it? There, there was this one section where they said seven heartbeats, that's what they got from the witches, right? The seven heartbeats, because that's all they can do. And after that, it will make no difference. They barely made a dent in the army. So, I don't know, in, in Lord of the Rings, they got out of it with an undead army showing up in the last minute. What, what's going to happen here? <laughs> I, I mean, I got the sense that they, like, like you're talking about like in this specific battle or like long term? In this specific battle, like how are it feels like they've been fighting for hours and they made a tiny dent in the ranks of the shank. <laughs> I, I got the sense that they like at, at least the bulk of the army had fought off the shrink towards the end there, and that I, I the only group that I was particularly like, I don't know how they're getting out of this was Sorewheel's group, where it kind of felt like everyone except Sorewheel just got killed. Now, I suspect that's not the case. Uh, that would be. I mean, that would be some Red Wedding shit. Like, if, if, if the, that entire subcast of characters is just, like, wiped out now, um, it would definitely... That would be a, a, a hard hit, but I suspect there will be some more survivors. I mean, we definitely know the um, Mandate Schoolman's dead, right? We saw him on page get killed, mm -hmm. and I don't know. I For some reason, I mean, I'd have to go back and oh. reread to think why why I got the... I mean, I, I don't think this this rank are done. Obviously, they're going to come back, and there's even more of them, but... Um, I no, I think you're like right. I think the way that that scene ended, like before we switched to Sorvi, was that they started singing the beggar's lament, right. and then they conquered just like that, and that right. was the end of that. I, I thought they were still fighting it through it, but maybe that just means that they are done. They got through the hordes of Shrank. Yeah, I, I, that, at least how I read it is they kind of it, it's like the um. It reminds me, actually, I remember thinking as I was reading it of the, um, oh, what did they, what was the word that was used in the warrior prophet, I think it was, um, where like the tide of one of the battles changed. I think it's at the very end and it, it's talking about, um, you know, like the, just the fervor, um, the battle lust of the uh, Enrithi armies oh my god what is the exact word they use it's repeated over and over again it's like a thematic point i cannot believe i'm blanking on this anyway but that you know basically they won because they were more passionate and they were more like they almost became like a force of nature and it, it kind of felt like like that was the the same thing that happened here um in that you know the humans just sort of united in this like almost like animal sense of just like pure raw power um kind of in the same way this the strength are and but i guess you know humans are are larger um and you know they have the addition of more mages and things like that and so um i think i think they won at the end there certainly not without you know they took heavy losses uh, my my question is how the hell they're gonna make it all the way there um if they keep having battles like this, but we'll, I guess we'll see. After, uh, I th uh, so a couple of things, I think the, we've talked about this before, about this series being a little bit more, the writing style is a little different. I think this was more of a, a step-by-step, -step, like it was very matter of fact, the, the battle was, it was a lot easier to follow. It wasn't as long either. And I just started to wonder, I'm, I'll try not to get into Blood Meridian spoilers, but I wonder what the Shrank represent or what they may mean to the story in, in a broader sense. Yeah, it's interesting. The, the, we're, you know, we are invited to not sympathize, but empathize, I guess, with the Shrank when they're being, when that one was captured in an earlier chapter and tortured and you know, there there is that level of like, well, they are like sentient creatures, maybe even sapient. And 
you know, that, but they are also seemingly pretty evil. Um, I forget what was it was in the first trilogy when someone talked about, or was it just us joking around talking about like domesticating strength? Is that something that actually happened in the books or, or was that just us memeing? Um, I don't remember, but like that idea, like, it, you know, it's a question, like, can you, I mean, these are like living creatures. Can you domesticate them? You know, like humans domesticated wolves. Um, I, I don't know. When they come across the, uh, what's her name? Mimara lookalike, the consult felt like they were recognizing consult for the first time. So do the Shrank not know of the consult? I don't think they've been controlled by them in a while, um, or at least the majority of the Horde, because mm. um, they've been kind of wild, right? I, they they used, certainly used to be, right? In the first apocalypse, that's what they were created for. You know, that's mm. where we even get, like, the, the term Horde for them when they're, like, amassed into an army, um, which they don't naturally do. I, I guess they naturally more, like, like, smaller bands, you know? Not to go back to wolves, but, like, kind of like wolf packs. Actually, maybe it's appropriate I keep going to wolves because I think they're described as having lupine features in some way. Maybe I'm making that up. I don't know. <laughs> oh, they have dog bodies. That's what it is. Yeah. They're, the, they're the body of a dog. Interesting. <laughs> but like the chest, like the N-word, you know. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Speaking of who's controlling the shrank, we find out the non-men are controlling the shrank. Is that surprising to us? I feel like it is, right? that they're the ones driving the shrank code did we know about that before uh i mean insofar as we saw at least some of the non-men among the consult um but i guess mm. i'm not shocked i mean it's interesting i want to know who these non-men are certainly and like you know i'm increasingly curious about their story and and where they came from as we know more about the non-men but um in some ways, it just also makes sense, too, because, like, who else is going to be the, the, the captains or commanders or generals, you know, the higher-ups in the rank armies, um, you know, with, considering that there are only two of the, of the Inkeroi left. And, you know, I guess there's still the open question of, like, are there any humans left fighting for the consult? Um, that's one thing I don't know if we know yet. Yeah. I don't remember seeing any, um, but please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't. I don't recall seeing any. Some other favorite bits from the battle. I loved the description of the witches. How they fought. How they their dresses opened up like flowers. They were like bars of light, lighting up like what the bar of heaven. And it turns out that this is a Gnostic school, which is interesting, right? Yeah. Um, the, what, what's the name of the, the witch school? I forget. It starts Something with starting with an S. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I remember. It's to keep track of all of these words. Um, but, yeah, I think... I wonder how... So it's the power of the Gnostic school... Minus the nightly terrors. <laughs> so they, they have to be a formidable bunch. Yeah, that sounds like a good, good deal. <laughs> and I, I am, for some reason, super interested in the founding of it. Did, did Kellis impart the Gnostic knowledge to them that would allow them? Or did he uh, demand that the mandate schoolmen do so? <laughs> Maybe a little of both. I mean, I feel like Kels is probably too busy to, like, teach them all himself. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he specifically mentored, you know, his daughter, for example, and maybe some of the earliest witches. But I have to imagine the mandate did the majority of the training there. Just just because, you know, just in terms of, like, time commitment, Kels has got to be super busy, you know. Mm. Yeah, I meant more like the first few, like, seeding the school would Kellis have done that? But yeah, it might, might be some combination of the two. Yeah, I think he established the school and there was some priest or somebody who trained the the students there, the witches. Hmm. Yeah. 
there's definitely it, it's interesting there, there's definitely room for like stories to be told in the time gap like there there's some interesting struggles going on in the unification wars and you know the rise not not that i'm saying like you know baker i desperately need to read this like i like kind of having the mystery and to fill in the blanks but like you know there there is some interesting drama interesting stories interesting questions there you know as as you're kind of bringing up varsha i i'm so something that just occur occurred to me is if we're playing with lord of the rings parallels so i was thinking about like okay you know which humans are turning on other humankind to join sauron i mean you know the consult uh and, and like things like that like if there are any more lord of the rings parallels which i would be shocked if we've seen the last of them who is a potential candidate for a saruman figure like is a Kamian potentially going to work against Kellis and be like a traitorous wizard? I mean, he already is kind of working against Kellis. This is me just completely spitballing a theory. But I was just thinking of like, you know, I don't know <laughs> if he would go. Because so, like Saruman, the, the interesting thing that I think is highlighted more in the books, even in like than the movies, is like he's kind of working with Sauron, but he's not like specifically just, like serving Sauron. Like Sauron's kind of the ultimate big bad, but he's like... Saruman is his own like faction, you could say, and I wonder if Akamian is going to fit into a sort of similar role. Um, although that that would then imply, I guess, that like Akamian would get shrank under his control, which I don't really see happening. Um, but I I don't know. That's just a crazy theory I'm throwing out. I'm I'm, I'm sorry, Dan's not here to hear me <laughs> throwing shit at the wall. <laughs> the <laughs> That would make Kellis Gandalf, wouldn't it? He kind of is. He's kind of he's kind of Gandalf, kind of Aragorn. Mm. I mean, certainly Fair Akamian enough. is more of the Gandalf figure in the first trilogy. But like, you know, what if Gandalf decided, uh, you know, <laughs> Aragorn was a piece of shit and you know wanted to kill him and was a false prophet and blah blah blah. Um, yeah, yeah, I like that. I'm I'm holding out for that undead army. <laughs> yes. That's what I'd like to see. Who are the undead in this world? We'll bring some demons from hell. That's who we'll bring. I was going to say, I feel like it's demons, right? In, in this universe, That that's what would line up with everything we've seen world building wise. Um, we have seen sort of ghosts, but it doesn't seem like they're like, they don't like murder people they kind of just like appear or sort of are like almost illusory figures um you know when there's a, like kind of a, a blending between hell and the world um like we saw in the plains of mangetta is that mm. and then also when uh in Silagis. the seal that wasn't a seal showed up <laughs> right which <laughs> which mamara remember today for some reason like in these chapters it was yeah. the uh the swayal sisterhood the oh, there we go yeah. swayal sisterhood that's right yes i will probably forget that by next time unless it comes up 20 more times <laughs> 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 so, um any other thought on that chapter we we want to move on to what for me was the most exciting chapter of the bunch even though it was much more intimate um just one thing i think the proyas v Kellis conversation at the very beginning of the chapter oh yeah in oh, which right. that's how can we skip my boy proyas in which Kellis uh removed proyas's doubt by asking him to doubt it seems like at least superficially <laughs> a fucking guy Kellis. <laughs> I love he, the he literally like Royce was like starting to see the light, and of course, the way he gets to me is like, "Yes, exactly. That's what you should be doing. That's why I keep you around. You're so right to doubt me and the cause." And it's like <laughs> not using his doubt against him. <laughs> that, that was that was his one holdover from a commune, right? And yeah. that, yeah. And I love the. Uh, I forget it now. It was, I read it almost a week ago, but the description of his 
childhood with a commune i think the fact that as a teacher he took him seriously not you know dismissed him as a child i think that's the general impression i have <laughs> left from that but yeah that, that was really good i'm i'm curious to see i would like more proes in the upcoming chapters or the remaining two books see where this relationship goes i agree steve smiling <laughs> mysteriously <laughs> uh, maybe maybe he'll be around i oh no <laughs> when you put it like that is he going to die <laughs> i have no I doubt he's going to die there's no way he lives out this final set of books but that said i i hope he gets a good death and i hope we get him at least for a while longer <laughs> this see, is probably Proyce just has, like, heroic death written all over him. Mm. As, I as as I, like, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, would, I actually wouldn't even be surprised if he doesn't make it to Golgo Taroth. If he, like, dies in, like, one big battle, like, mm. help hold the line or something. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I would like to see him go, you know, <laughs> go all the way, reach Mount Doom, but I, I, don't, I don't know if he will. <laughs> He's he's. I'm latching onto him now as a as a Samwise Gamgee figure. I don't know why, but that's that's the parallel I'm making. He's he's just that, so loyal. Again, Kellis. That would make Kellis Frodo. So Frodo, <laughs> Gandalf. Why you gotta kill all my favorite characters like that? <laughs> I blame it on Baker. He just he's determined to take all of our favorite fantasy tropes and characters and make them just the most horrible thing you can imagine. Okay. So another thing that I thought was interesting from that chapter was Sor Whale being chosen for the gods, from chosen by the gods to kill. Yes. Oh yeah. Which does that? I mean, I know we sort of ruled out that Sor Whale has nothing to do with the White Luck Warrior because, uh, because the White Luck Warrior is so far away and having some mad thoughts by himself as he's walking his way through wherever but that what that echoes what we saw in the previous italicized segment where he sees the aspect emperor dead the white luck warrior right so yeah. that i i forget who it was uh, that had the theory that the white luck warrior isn't a person but sort of like a soul or spirit that's moving through people and will eventually arrive at sorvil um, I think I'm liking that theory more more now. I, I definitely this. felt like this set of chapters confirmed that. I mean, it, it seems like I'm certainly open to the idea that Baker is going to pull the rug out from under us at the end. But it seems like this is we're just watching a very slow bullet in action. And yeah, we're watching the White Luck Warrior switch from host to host and is going to end presumably in the last book, in Sorwheel, who's going to kill Kellis. Mm. And I'm curious if, if Baker, it would, it would be, I, I think it would be very interesting if he doesn't like subvert our expectations in any way. And like, literally he tells us here what's going to happen. And like, that is just what, what happens. Like, if it's just like, yep, yeah, that's, this is the gods at work. What are you going to do? Yeah. Even yeah. Kellis isn't beyond their power. I'd like that. I would very much. On on the other on the subject of Sorby, the other thing that was interesting was immediately after declaring himself a non believer king, like to Soranga, he convinced him that, you know, like he just called me out, I don't know why. Um he realizes that Callus's battle is real, that it's not a made up cause. I think he was coming to that realization in the previous chapters, but now seeing the hordes of Shrank he really realizes that. So I'm very curious to see how these two aspects of him are going to conflict with each other later. And, because... and the other the other part of that, right, is that and him being like blessed by the gods is that Kellis can't see through him. Kellis can't read him. Mm -hmm. None of the Dunyane can read through him or anyone trained uh, in the Logos. They, they think they can, but he is protected, which is really interesting one because that he's the first person we've ever like known that that's a thing and two uh it, it definitely recontextualizes that scene at the end of the last book um i think that's literally how the last book ends and he's yeah. like Kellis got played basically and he mm. doesn't he doesn't know it 
and he has this, you know, this, this weapon in his midst that he, you know, Kalos is really intelligent, so I wouldn't be surprised if he, I guess that's where, where I'm at at the end of, you know, this reveal is wondering, like, is Kalos, even though he maybe can't read Sword Wheel's emotions accurately, is he still appropriately wary of Sword Wheel and aware of the idea that he is competing against the gods? You know, like, I mean, he talks with Proyas. You know, there is a discussion that he knows that the gods have different views, different, you know, uh, motivations, different goals, and that some are fighting against him. And I wonder what his contingencies are to deal with that, because it, it he very clearly believes that they exist, rightfully, seemingly. And, you know, if if you have a bunch of gods, you know, these higher beings coming at you, like... I almost feel like the way you have to combat that as a mortal is to team up with another god. But I, I don't know. I don't know what Kellis' plan is here. You know, what's what's the strategy? Mm. And I guess we'll we'll see if he has one. I mean, I'm sure he has something, but is it good enough? Yeah. You know? mm. Yeah. Yeah, the rumors of him having been in hell and all of that, I think. Yeah, hopefully we'll find out more about that. Maybe he's made a deal with, uh, it sounds like from the conversation we see between the Satma Nanaferi and the Fanyal, is that his name? That one God's heaven is another God's hell. It, mm. I yeah. don't know if I'm reading too much of that, but it does sound like you have to sort of be pulled into, um, if you don't worship that God, and if you get pulled into their heaven, that might just end up being your hell, it seems like. And and not because the God is going to make you suffer for not believing in them. It's just like not where you wanted to go <laughs> when you died. Um, but yeah, that that should be interesting to see if he made a deal with any of the gods. So what he called hell could very well be, you know, just the realm of one of the gods that he got help from, maybe. Sorry, one last thing before we move on to this next chapter <laughs> that Carl's reading to. The Beggar's Lament. It's... The, the way that's named, it is interesting. Like, I, I did wonder, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if, because it's the beggar's lament and Yathwar is the goddess of the beggars and the slaves and so on all the week, if that's what saved them from the shrank, uh, the mm. beggar's lament. But then, given how she's against Kellis, that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. But that, that was a curious song to have them win the battle with yeah i didn't even think about the divine intervention aspect of that if that if that in any way encouraged or empowered her to help protect them i don't think it's impossible that Yatwer wants Kellis to fall but doesn't necessarily want mankind to fall i mean we we, the, the, we know she doesn't the gods are not pro no god right because the, the no god is their oblivion and so, wow, the gods really are sort of competing against themselves. <laughs> it's occurring to me. Their own best interest is, like, to support Kellis, even though he's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, kind of the same, I guess, that's sort of the same, you know, issue we have as, as the readers is it's like, well, someone's got to do it, you know? Someone has to stop the no god and the you know whatever the no god is in the consult and probably like wipe the last of the Inkaroi out damn baker's really asking questions with no easy answers here <laughs> yes it's interesting that all of these characters it's very shakespearean or going back even older to like you know greek tragedies which we know like the Iliad, for example, influenced this series and, you know, a lot of the old classics. Uh, Baker talks about like trying to evoke those stories um, in his like writing style. And, you know, when he's writing battles, that's why he like mentions all the factions, right? As to be the sort of like pseudo history. Um, but it, it's very like uh, of those types of stories that these characters are like their own downfall, even the gods, right? Because if the gods stop Kellis and Kellis is their one hope of preventing the no god from coming then 
I mean, they're, they're sabotaging themselves just for ego seemingly, right? Like, cause it doesn't seem like Kellis can like kill the gods. It seems like only the no God can kill the gods. So if Kellis is trying to like, they should be helping him, but because he is a false prophet, they're like, screw you. We're going to kill you instead. It's a, uh, oh, and then, you know, the same thing with Kellis. I'm sure Kellis is, you know, writing his own doom as we speak. I mean, clearly he is. He's like, doing the false prophet bullshit and it's going to lead to him getting killed one way or another. <laughs> is it is it possible that the gods have reason to think that what Kellis is doing is it going to prevent the no gods uh, rebirth but rather cause it, you know, like the oh, prof prophecy stories often do that right. you try to prevent a prophecy from happening and that's what brings about the events the prophecy is predicting. Uh, not that we're dealing with the prophecy here, but you know something to that effect. What he's trying to prevent might actually end up being caused by the actions he's taking, and that's what they're trying to stop. But yeah, I, I think overall the reason for the gods' uh, antagony is that the right word? Is that what I'm looking for? Antagonism. To, yeah, towards Kellis seems strange. At well, best. I I want to continue off of that. So, like you're talking about, you know, the the, the kind of classic trope of the by trying to avoid the prophecy, you make the prophecy happen. If like, you know, we wondered before, well, why didn't they stop Kellis earlier? And I guess you could go into the idea that they exist, you know, in a sort of four dimensional way so that like any individual moment or even like span of years isn't as important to them as like the long-term picture. So, you know, they, like they weren't that worried about Kellis initially. Like it just like wasn't, that's just not how they perceive things. It wasn't, that, you know, a big enough concern. But I, I, another possibility is that Kellis, they couldn't foresee Kellis mm. because he's connected to no God and they can't foresee the no God. And we already know Kellis has some sort of weird connection with the no God, right? He's been right. dreaming of the no God. Like those, that's the earliest visions he's had. Um, and so I wonder if, yeah, if there's some sort of like, I don't know if it, like the idea is like the no God comes out of Kellis somehow or like whether that's in like a literal sort of like literally in, inhabits his body or something or like the no God, something that Kellis does is what makes the no God happen. And so Kellis, mm -hmm. through being intrinsically tied to the no God, is also in sort of a blind spot uh, for the gods. And so they couldn't stop him until he was already, you know, risen to power. Yeah. And then... Continuing that train of thought, then the idea of like, you know, by trying to stop Kellis, they end up leading to Kellis doing something that makes the no god happen. Um, mm. that, that that would be very Greek tragedy. I, I don't know. Um, I think that's an interesting idea you put yeah. forward, Arsha. There's many layers and levels. So the gods think that Kellis is going to bring about the no god, but maybe he might stop them if the gods didn't interfere. So many right. <laughs> interactions of like trying to, you're know, bringing about the thing you're trying to prevent, which when done well, I don't dislike it so much, especially in prophecy stories. I, I, I intensely dislike it. I've come to realize because it's too blatant and on the nose. But this one is interesting if, if, if that's what's being worked at in the back in the background i i think that that would be a very interesting weaving of the story i'm i'm a fan of the trope generally especially if it's done in an unexpected way yeah uh, but this is i mean it is if that is how it plays out this is an additional spin on it right that because it's the gods to making that happen right and the idea right. that like it's not just that they heard a prophecy which is how it normally goes right is like the hero goes to an oracle the oracle tells them this thing the hero's like no i'm not gonna let that happen so i'm gonna like you know kill these people and oh no by doing that i get someone to come back and kill me or some bullshit like that right um in this case it's like they they see the threat they want to you know it, like in the future multiple times like not just in the future like all at once right because mm. they view things it's just like a, a more four dimensional, almost like sci fi way of doing it, right? Where it's like it's it's not time travel and it's not prophecy. It's like it's just like it just is. It's yeah. determinism, as we've talked about, right? It's like this idea that they know this thing is ha coming and you know, they're like, well, we're going to stop it, but they don't realize that them trying to stop it is. I mean, it's the same idea, but like presented slightly differently. I, I, it's hard to express, but 
Yeah. No, I I think that makes sense, and and I agree with you. I I it isn't done like quite so like it's what I call blatant before. Maybe it wasn't the right word, but it's not very clear as the story is unraveling that you know they are clearly taking the path that will bring about the prophecy. It's more that it's all unintentional. It just happens because right. it is, like you said. So. All right. So since we're talking about determinism and so on, we can probably start the next chapter, which what path would you like to talk about first, Carl? I mean, the number one thing for me is just the climax of it all. Of I was so stressed and so excited. I could not. My eyes were glued to the page uh, with Enrilitas and Mathanet and Kelmomas. It was just what one of the best scenes i've ever read just period like into sentence any book any series i just thought it was phenomenal the twists and the turns and then the way it all ends like you keep thinking it's going to go one way and then it goes somewhere else and it all makes sense like it all fits um even though we still have some questions right of like ultimately why did in really tuss do what he did and you know i think it's very possible we'll never really know we'll only in- be able to interpret um, I mean, I guess I'll start there. What do you think? Like, based on, I don't, I don't know, you know, I don't know if we ever get answers later on, so I don't know if Steve can answer, but what are your thoughts, Barsha, about why Enriditas acted the way he did? So the default, default reasoning that I, I don't think I have a better answer than this, actually, is that he has been maybe suffering all the yelling and screaming his fits of passion um the the times we saw him um what was what i'm looking for when he's clear-headed and he's like cruel you might seem you might think that he's like careless and everything's fine and he can go on living like this forever but maybe he's been suffering with his like um what fits of passion and he saw this as a way out and he set it up so that Maithanet would kill him. So, like, I mean, I think it's pretty reasonable to assume that Indrilatis wanted to be killed, not that he was trying to kill Maithanet. I don't think that was his goal. I think he wanted Maithanet to kill him, and that's why he attacked him. As for why he revealed Kelmomus's nature to Maithanet, <laughs> the optimist in me thinks it's because he wants to protect Esmenet from the kid but I don't know I don't know <laughs> I don't know if that's true <laughs> because, it, no. go ahead Sorry. no please oh, no, I was gonna say I just feel like he's such a tragic character with the heart of Mathanet and the intellect of Kellis it's to have both of those personalities both of those traits in one person that must be like torture to not be yeah. able to control it and it doesn't seem like he had None of the kids have, doesn't seem like many of the, well, some of the kids have had training, but didn't seem like he really ever really had a chance because he doesn't know how to control the Dunyan side of him. And he's also has the heart of Maithanet. So it's, or I'm sorry, of uh, Esme, Esmanet. So it, it seems like he was, he's just been screwed from the very beginning. Right. Absolutely. No, I mean, yeah, tragic is absolutely the right word for his character. And I, I, definitely think you know that the way that he is described right is having Esmanet's heart essentially meaning that he can feel profound empathy and profound compassion and what that does to someone when you can like read their inner darkest secrets like yeah i have to imagine that's incredibly painful where you're driven you know you're, you're both like beyond the world and of it and it <sighs> The the thing I'm struggling with is, like, he must know that in trying to kill Mathanet and in doing so leading Mathanet to kill him, that he is playing into Kelmomis' hands and is going to make Mathanet, who is maybe the most capable person of defeating Kelmomis, in the empire at this point short of Kellis, obviously or or maybe even the older siblings but you know the people who are actually present 
to deal with Kel Melnish. He, uh, to me, it seems like he's sabotaging their ability, Nathanette's ability to do so. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm struggling with like, because I agree, I think, is it just this purely emotional, selfish drive of like, this is my moment to die finally, to like be free of this mortal coil? Or does he have a broader plan is what I'm wondering, right? Like, is there something he's planning? Is he actively trying to fight Kelmomis in some way? Or is he trying to get what he wants and also still in some ways defending Kelmomis, just feeling some base instinctual love for his brother, even though he can see his brother as a monster? Or, you know, I, and again, the, the big question mark for me is like, we're led to believe, although it's unclear because we're not never in and really toss his head, that he loves his mother, right? And we're told he has her heart. And if he feels that sort of empathy, that sort of emotion, if he can relate to people, relate maybe isn't the right word, but like feel what other people feel and, and connect with them on that level, then surely he does love his mom. Right, because clearly she loves him so much, and beyond that, it's like that's human nature, right? To like form that animal attachment, and so isn't he sabotaging her by letting Kelmomis run free and harming the one person? Like I, they, I, I'm struggling. To, I, I get he's like quote unquote mad, and and certainly to a degree that that is a, a, an appropriate way of describing him and his behavior. But I, I'm just like I'm, I'm. I guess I, yeah, I'm just unclear on like, does he have a plan? Does he not have a plan? Was he thinking multiple steps ahead? You know, he's smart enough to, and we just don't see it yet. What this, what he, because presumably he can sort of, he's untrained, but he can probably help, you know, make plans, right? And, you know, in the same way that he like planned for this to some degree. I don't think this was a spontaneous decision. I think he went into this conversation knowing what he was going to do. You know, does he believe that by having Mathanet kill him, that is going to lead to, and then therefore Mathanet becoming an outlaw or becoming exiled? Like, is that going to lead to Kelmomas' downfall? And therefore, you know, the his mother's safety or the, the empire's safety? I, I, I don't know. It's... I'm so, really not sure what to think. So Maithanet, um, Esmond had tried to get him arrested and nobody would raise a finger against him, right? So is it possible that he isn't really in danger and so uh, for, of exile or execution? And Idila does knew that, but now Maithanet knows about Kelmomus and he would... Um, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. And so he would maybe somehow protect Esmanet from the kid by revealing to her his nature. Although I think that would be a harder blow than whatever Calmomus would do to her. Um, I, I just feel like there's no way that this ends without Esmanet and Mathanet being irreconcilable. And therefore, Mathanet is a threat to Esmanet. And if he loves his mother, I don't know why he would make that happen. Right. Like even beyond like defeating Kelmomis, like if you care for your mother at all, would you not try to like you already know you're going to cause her pain? Mm. And, and again, I guess that's the question, right? Is like, does he actually like uh, just the way he's described? I, I feel like we have to believe that he does have some affection for her. And, you know, that's part of the reason that he abuses her the way he does is because he loves her in his own fucked up way. And so I, you know. I don't know. I don't. We'll see. We'll see where the story goes. Um, it, it's certainly too early to tell. That that was just my big question mark coming out of that scene, um, yeah. which again I thought was j just an all time great. You know, um, uh, easily among the best of this series, and you know, really any series I've read. I just just like perfectly, perfectly done. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. I loved that scene as well i i was talking earlier about how all these chapters had moments that wowed me these three chapters in particular and i think in this one it was that conversation between the three of them we talked a little bit um at least i was a little dissatisfied uh but in about the conversation between Kellis and 
Moengus, right at the end of the first yeah. trilogy, where it felt like it they were it had too much detail for it to mean like a Dunian conversation, in my opinion. But this one, I think, was perfect. Um, first, the Indila the Skelmomus one we saw before this, and then now these three guys, where basically they dropped all pretense. <laughs> that they usually keep up and they go to the hard hitting facts. I think that was brilliant. And yes, I was on the edge of my seat and I, I read late into the night for, for this this particular chapter. I to your point about whether or not Indilatus had some sort of plan, he seems to know things that we have no idea how he knows, right? Like when he brings up the thousandfold thought. And there was one other thing as well that he mentioned which if he's that isolated how is he getting this information um which makes me think that you may be right about the fact like i i didn't think he had any long-term motives out of what or whatever this is other than i want to die but i also lack the Im imagination to think beyond that but this makes sense to me that he might have a long-term plan given that he has access to information that Maybe he doesn't otherwise. So is he like Kelmomus in that he has been acquiring <laughs> information, has his own web and has been doing, manipulating it somehow. We also find out about the the tunnels and stuff that Kelmomus has been roaming. Is yeah. it possible Indilatus also used to or does go around there and gather information the same way Kel did? Maybe. I, I, another idea that may be connected or not, I don't know. And I don't know how we would ever find out. Um, but Kellis, the, the way it, or a point of view of at his visions as they've been described to us is like he went mad and started seeing things, right? And those visions may be real. They, I mean, they are. To me, it seems pretty clear that they're real to whatever accuracy or degree I think is maybe more debatable, but um, he clearly has like actual magical visions. Maybe in really Tuss does too, right? Like I, I don't, he is seemingly mad, but he is his father's son. And, you know, again, that mad description, uh, it's the same way that Moingus describes Kellis. And so obviously Kellis is much more functional as a human being but i don't know that's just something to throw out it's like maybe he has some connection to the, the outside as well and and can see the future uh in in glimpses of his own and maybe he has a connection to a god and he may not even realize it um i don't know i'm, I'm completely spitballing here but that's just an idea yeah that that makes sense it, it's also strange a uh, a little bit i think maybe not really but that server is the only one of kellis's children who can do magic so is it have the others not had not been taught or is it th that they weren't born with the ability and kellis was he able to acquire sorcery because he is it a genetic thing i i don't know do we know how people become sorcerers in this world is it just by learning what they need to or do they need to have some innate ability? It sounds like the former, based on what we know of Memara and Sarva, but but is it strange that these are the only children, well, Sarva is the only one who can do magic? I guess I had sort of taken it for granted that Kayutas could do magic, but I guess you're right. We haven't seen him do it, so maybe, have we? I guess, he, yeah, he, he doesn't do magic. Huh. Any idea yeah. who the who the voice or what the voice is that Kilmomus is hearing? I I've, I've sort of settled on Samarmus, like the evil in Samarmus, but Oh really? No, I think for, it's for sure a god. <laughs> Some god? I think for sure a god. I don't know which god. I, I think a jokely makes sense just because of the ties between them, but I I am basically like convinced uh, at this point. I I just feel like that's not like some weird psychological pseudo magical thing. Like I think it's like fully the divine 
intervening to lead to Callus's downfall. Hmm. Do you think then it's something to do with Yathwar? Because I I keep noticing how every time we get a Kelmomis section, it is preceded by something to do with the White Luck Warrior or uh, Satma Nanaferi. That could just be like a structural thing because all those things are together in the same chapter usually. Or it could also mean something <laughs> like in the God department that Kelis, sorry, not Kelmomis keeps hearing. I, I'm reminded, we literally get a scene. I think it's one of those scenes of uh, Nana Fairy where she talks, or like maybe it's the White Luck Warriors' point of view. I forget. But they like realize that they can see inside the Imperial Palace and they're like sitting on the Empress's lap or something. There's some scene like that that literally happens in these chapters where mm. to me it became. That was like confirmation that Yacht were, oh God, I wish I could remember what it was. I read these a couple weeks ago. Um, but there's literally a scene where it's like, they're like, yeah, we, 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 are, we are inside the palace and like at the emperor, empress's breast. Um, shoot. I didn't read ahead. So that's definitely not, that's not something that happens next. This is. Oh, I'm gonna find this now. Okay, I don't, I don't recall it, but that would be super interesting. I may have just read past it, but yeah. It it was pretty like it was a quick. It was like a line or two, so it wasn't it wasn't like a whole section. Um, yeah. And move on while I'm looking this up. Kelma was one. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, here sorry, it is. It's opening of eight. Um. Yeah, it's the White Luck Warrior. So um, the ending, uh, he saw the piling of structure and marble beauty that was the Endiamine Heights, his eyes roaming until they found the famed veranda behind the Aspect Emperor's throne room, where the gift of Yacht were glimpsed himself peering back, the Holy Empress beside him. Okay. The gift of Yacht were, meaning, right, mm -hmm. the White Luck Warrior, uh, I mean, as we've been led to understand, and I mean, who is beside the Holy Empress? That has to be Kelmomis, right? Like, uh, unless I, I guess that's just one way to read it. I guess maybe there's other possibilities, but like, that's the only person I can imagine who's sitting directly next to. That makes uh, sense. Esmanet. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I mean, I don't like that, but I like that <laughs> because I've been, again, this is the optimistic side of me, but I've been thinking of the white luck warrior as a force for good. I don't know why, but, and, <laughs> and if they're secretly dictating to Kel Momus, which brings up all sorts of questions, like why did they, why did Yathwar make Kel Momus kill their her priestess right that's who uh he killed yeah uh, apart from samarmus so why did and that was done through the voice in his head that that's what egged him on to do that so if that's true then i don't like yathwar very much so far i was with her like yes the goddess of the weak the slaves everyone can worship her and feel strong and feel powerful somehow and this is this would very much change my mind about that i think that's yeah i i think that it, this is a, a consistent through line for baker in general that like these people and and entities in power, you know, those with the, 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 that are sort of beyond ordinary people, you know, the, the great, you could say, ultimately view those who are in some material way beneath them as undeserving of respect or compassion or as just like pawns. And, you know, obviously you see that with Kellis, you know, you see that with any number of, of kings and emperors and people like that. Um, but, you know, I think that's also, 
right like you want to cheer for for Yatwer because of what she's the goddess of and also because she's combating Kellis and we hate Kellis but then you're also like oh but she kind of sucks too you know in the same way that you kind of want to cheer for Kellis because you're like well he's fighting the consult and the consult are the bad guys but Kellis is also you know a bad guy yeah <laughs> yeah it's tough and even a Kamian, right where you're like, I, I want to support this guy, but he's not doing very morally upstanding things. No. And his end game, who is it going to help? Like, that, he's just pursuing his revenge. Like, mm -hmm. he's not making the world a better place, you know? There, there's nothing noble about what he's doing. He, he kind of lies to himself, but, like, what... If he really wants to, like, dethrone Kellis or, like, expose Kellis, I don't know that just, like destroying him strictly is that like i feel like it, to me his plan is pretty simplistic and in that simplicity you know of just destroying callus like it, it it doesn't tackle you know the other enemies that they're facing and you know the nuance of the position um which i think we have like a quote about that um at the beginning of one of these chapters about ambiguity and yeah complexity and, and mm -hmm. How fancy i don't know we, we can get to that when we talk quotes yeah yeah the, the akamian to your point about not being an upstanding citizen right this moment he killed a bunch of people because he doesn't want them to bring word back to the great ordeal that he's there with a bunch of the skin eaters right and also yeah and also to your point about revenge and his plan being simplistic what what does what is the shape of the revenge that he is envisioning because let's say he shows up at Ishwal, then what if he yeah he's already written a book that nobody is reading about the origins of the aspect emperor <laughs> and it's being shut down and whatnot but let's say it was widely circulated look at the size of the great audience you're do you really think you can change the mind of that many people who have been indoctrinated into this religion? And if that is not your goal, which it seems unlikely that it is, what is? Are you trying? Is he trying to figure out a way to kill Kellis? Um, but why that's does he need to do that? Yeah, then? Yeah. That's how I've interpreted it. Is he? He just at this point is like, I have to figure out Kellis's weakness. And then exploit it and bring him down. And he's not like really caring or thinking, giving much thought to everything around Kellis and everyone around Kellis. It's just simply find find out what Kellis is, find out how to break him, and then do that. Because mm. you're right. Like, we what is it? What is his end game? You know, what's what's the shape of it? You know, I, we know he like I think he's explicitly thought or said that he wants to destroy Kellis, but like, what does that actually mean? Yeah, you know, and I think part of it is just he doesn't know because he doesn't know what the Dunian are. He, he he doesn't know where Ishual is. He doesn't know what their weakness is. You know how to stop Kellis, um, and so he's uncertain. I think that's part of the issue. But like for someone who thinks and thinks and thinks is like you know it's a notable aspect of his character. You know, being this intellectual, he's really not giving this much thought. <laughs> you know, he he has this very. It's hardly even a plan. You know. <laughs> He, he he just like gave himself a couple goals and was like and and then i'll destroy Kellis. and it's like okay well <laughs> sure like easier said than done buddy he's got a plan for a plan like we use date for a date he's got a plan for a plan. yeah <laughs> god mm, yeah speaking of that group there the she yeah i guess the most interesting thing to me from the third chapter was how the Kiri, Shiri, how are we pronouncing it? The yeah. Kiri. <laughs> the, um, how that's affecting them. And and I think, again, these, this chapter was really interesting because I think it's fairly obvious that their apathy and indifference, their inability to feel anything uh, with any sort of fashion is coming from the kiri but there's a mild just a mild possibility that it's also the exhaustion that driving them to be like that 
it becomes clear <laughs> towards the end that that it's it's entirely this drug thing but i mean i think there's room for their exhaustion to play a role because i think you're right that's very human to be so tired that you just stop caring you know mm-hmm. like that that's that is kind of what happens to people you know i i don't know that it numbs you entirely and makes you kind of almost like we we I don't know that this is the right word, but like sociopathic, you know, you stop caring about other people, stop connecting. Um, but the Kiri certainly just like makes that worse and exacerbates that issue. And I think it's interesting that it sort of makes sense just on a base mechanical perspective, because it's sort of turning them into non-men by consuming non-men. That's kind of there. They start to like think and feel like non-men think and feel. And, and so there's, you know, mm. it's obviously there's some like magical aspect to it, but like it's a magical aspect that like, like I'm a fan of soft magic, but I like something like this where it's like you're kind of taking something that feels almost like biological and translating it in this weird like sort of science fiction way. Um, it's it's cool. And I, I also want to say, I think I called that like last podcast or the one before that, that Kiri was like, I think I maybe even said non-men body parts or something um so pretty feeling close. pretty good about that yeah yeah <laughs> i did not guess it was uh king mara seen seen joy seen mara seen joy that i couldn't even begin that's that's pretty crazy if if mimara is right um because we don't get explicit confirmation but i feel like we're supposed to just be like yeah you know that makes sense do we know uh, who not, that guy is sorry he's like the big non-man king Okay. He, he's like the guy who was like leading the fight against the uh, the consult and was like he's in like a, a lot of their legends. Mm, okay. Yeah, that that makes sense. So how creepy was that scene where <laughs> where the non man came up to Mimara and then asked her to figure out what whose ashes these are and then she does apparently by looking within herself somehow. And also I'm like super terrified for this group now because he's he's gone from just handing out the kiri to making declarations of love for this group and we're like when when is he going to set them all on a fire <laughs> <laughs> Well and and yeah, the thing you haven't mentioned yet too is Esmenet's attracted to him Esmenet like wants him she wants to sleep with him and m- maybe is developing like weird fucked up feelings beyond that and i cannot what's crazy is i kind of like it i kind of i kind of want them to like hook up but uh it's i I don't know why it's like there's something like yeah when they first started it was like early in this book where like we first started seeing that develop in her pov and i was like i kind of dig it i'm here (laughs) for it uh that's so weird I, i i like it um and we're now seeing that like explicitly develop and and part of i guess what's interesting is like it's like falling in love with a vampire like you're like this thing is going to kill me <laughs> twilight <laughs> done right <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> like there's no turning into a non man there's no turning into it, it, you're just you're you're dead apparently he just kills you so hurrah <laughs> row dangerous he loves yeah. you so much he kills you <laughs> Biggest threat romance. Oh. None man yeah. romance. I was, yeah. <laughs> I was really sure that Mimara would end up with, or not end up with, like have some sort of affair with the captain, Kosoto. But this oh, is far more interesting and terrifying, I have to say. But interesting nevertheless. Yeah, agreed. This is, this is, this is way more interesting. Uh, I'm here for it. It's got that gothic, like there's something very gothic about it uh, that I, I quite enjoy. And it, it's a trope, right? The young, the beautiful young woman and like the pale, like uber old man. Like normally it's done in a way where it's not meant to be creepy. And so, you know, like Twilight, where you're like, she's in high school and he's like 200 years old. Like what's going on here? But like here, it's like, it's clearly meant to be creepy. And that that's part of what's so fun and like interesting about it. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I agree also, she's you. a grown woman, admittedly, too. She is, she's not, like, 16. She's, like, 30-something. Yeah. 30-something. <clears throat> yeah. Was it here that we had the recounting of the childhood? No, that was in the previous set of chapters. But um, before we move on to that bit, though, there was one other. What did you think of uh, Sal 
what he said about Kosotar. Like he sort of seems to have confirmed what we've been thinking about him all along that he's from the outside somehow. But then he, it's also the ravings of a madman. So should we believe him or not? I have no idea. I mean, I definitely think there's something up with Kosotar. Um, I I wouldn't put it past Baker for him to just be a fake, but. I actually feel like the more Baker move is for him to actually be not just as messed up as he seems, but even more messed up than he seems. Like to be some like just truly horrendous, mythical, historical something. Or I mean, he's clearly not like actually immortal in in the traditional sense, or he's not he's not super old. It seems like. Um, oh, I don't know. I don't know actually. I I think there's something going on there. Yeah, but Sorrel is certainly an unreliable narrator. But he's also that would make him a Zaudunyan Zaudunyani demon of sorts, which is immensely again interesting. If he's literally from hell, you mean? Yeah, I didn't even think about the fact that he's literally like from there. I was just thinking he'd like been there, but damn, that 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 would be crazy if he's like a a demon that. If if there are humans there or demons can look like humans in some way, that would actually be pretty cool. Um, that would be very D&D. I hadn't even <laughs> thought about that. And, and this started as a campaign, right? This, they started playing this with D&D. So may, maybe there are origins from that. That's an interesting idea. I like that. Hmm. We'll see. So I guess the last somewhat interesting thing here was the... Esmenet, what we find out about how Esmenet went to try and get Mimara back but failed and maybe we, we don't know yet how that story affected Mimara and her attitude towards Esmenet but I think for the readers at least it was I feel like it redeemed Esmenet a bit more than Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but yeah that, that, that whole conversation was very interesting too I, I think Akamian's, yeah, I mean, I, I continue to love his relationship with Mimara and, and the way that he sort of cuts through her lies in some ways. I, I mean, I think Akamian himself is an unreliable narrator, obviously, in that, like, the way he describes Esmenet in the best terms in terms of why she sold her daughter, I think I think that's open for a little more dialogue. You know, I, I think there is a selfish aspect to that. It wasn't purely this, like, selfless, I'm going to save her from death. Um, you know, I think that's maybe what Esmenet tells herself and certainly what Akamian tells himself about what Esmenet did, but I don't know that that's entirely the case. Um, that, that, that said, I, I, I love that Akamian kind of points out the hypocrisy in Mimara and like forces her to confront how similar she is with her mother and her own, you know, why she hates her mom so much is sort of, you know, the root of it is her love and, and their similarity and, you know, all of that. It's, yeah, it's just really emotionally impactful stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I'm curious to see where that goes or if we ever get to see, since they're all moving so far away from a man, whether we'll get to see a, a mo an Esmeret Mimara current, present times interaction between mm. the two of them. Yeah. I would love that. Yeah. I guess the other thing interesting about the Kiri is I, I wonder if Baker's like properly exploring addiction with that because of how, because of the rationalization that Akamian and Mimara both indulge in <laughs> to decide this is bad for us, we should stop. But oh no, we can't do without it. So let's continue taking it because I don't know, bad things will happen if we stop. <laughs> So that that was a very interesting conversation there too, and I think it's more than just the Kiri that that he's maybe that this section is Absolutely. maybe about, yeah. And, and you see it too with Mimara; she's pregnant, and that's what gets her to finally cut it off. Is she doesn't want to poison the baby, um, which is tragic because we know the baby isn't going to come out alive which I feel like she should know, but she seems to not have registered that consciously. Mm. Yeah. yeah. She keeps preventing herself from thinking further about it. Uh, I 
there were there are two aspects of it right? like one I, i don't know if she cares that much about revealing to a commune that she's carrying his child but i guess the second more important thing is maybe uh confronting the fact that the baby may not come out alive because of what a commune told her about the judging eye that's probably this, the thought she's preventing herself from having the, the, this is a bomb under the table too in terms of like not just emotionally for her but like still births i mean births ordinarily can be dangerous but like when you have like a fetus that is you know damaged like often times the mother suffers too right and uh like i'm thinking of like eptoc eptoc eptopic pregnancies which this is not that but you know like she could be physically in danger um from her own body but also you know she starts to give birth anywhere or starts to you know have a miscarriage she's it, extremely vulnerable surrounded by strength and who knows what else like she it's it, it is whenever it comes to to the forefront it's going to be a real threat for her yeah yep i i agree it is overall memara surrounded by all kinds of danger i'm terrified for her <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll see how all that goes i'm I have no idea where her story is going to go. She's a big question mark for me. I feel yeah. like Akamian is also due for like a a pseudo heroic death, but I, that also may be too traditional. I I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if he dies like defending Mimara. That feels like an appropriate place for a story to go, but I, I don't think that is happening in this book. Mm-hmm. That would be that, that again, that would be like some red wedding shit if it did. <laughs> um, but we'll we'll see. Yeah, I think I don't know, hot take. I don't care who dies as long as it's at the end of the series. I just want to keep <laughs> reading about my <laughs> characters that I like I, I, until the end. Kill them off, all off towards the end. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine by me. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. You have to have certain characters to go through the whole thing, right? Yeah. I mean, I I'm okay with like a, a a limited amount, but you certainly don't want like even George R. R. Martin, you know, you think about how many characters are if we just go by the tv show you know of the of the main characters actually survive until the end like it's it's the majority of the actual main characters if you look at like the pov characters in the books like most of the pov characters are still alive so it's it's certainly uh you, you just from a narrative perspective you don't want to get rid of all the characters people care about you know yeah makes sense it does are we ready to do quotes any other Let's topics do quotes. yeah sure Yeah, I just have one because I know we're uh, up against the clock, but um, page 282, in my, in my, we're all reading different editions. Mm-hmm. There was more than strength in accusation. There is the presumption of innocence, which is what makes it the first resort of the brokenhearted. Mm. Nice. I like that. That's that. a good one. I do love, I, I think this one is... it just speaks truthfully to me uh complexity begets ambiguity which yields in all ways to prejudice and avarice complication does not so much defeat men as arm them with fancy nice yeah i highlighted that one too it's yeah it's just so it, it that that one just really feels very uh constantly prescient i will say mm mm-hmm. I have on uh page 258 in the orbit paperback um often men only need speak sorry often men need only speak around things to come together and so remember what it means to speak through uh the thing that breaks the wall between Sorvi and Soranga I thought I think they made a joke that uh I already think you're mad and then this follows I like that Okay, one of the maybe the last thing, Varsha, do you think Zoranga and all the others are dead? I No, I think they were still fighting when we last saw, saw them. So Sorva saved Sorvi, but the others mm-hmm. might still make it. And I'm really hoping Zoranga is one of them. 
we yeah. we saw two people we i kind of cared about uh die or be abandoned right the translator obotvega he was abandoned too he was asked to stop in march that was sad yeah and the yeah i think three people <laughs> besides or we that we've been following from that group of scions i think would be too much but also they would lose the scions of all the kingdoms that there would be significant fallout from that i feel like Kel- strategically kelis needs to protect this group and more than just that one person but which also begs the question why why is sorvi important enough for them to save that way because they're far away from sakarpus now their supply chain or whatever it is that they were expecting from there is that still a thing that that was the reason we were given in the first book for why sorvi is important to kelis but is that still a thing now or is it the yathverian connection that's making kelis protect him i think there was a mention of he keeps the he keeps pieces of of places that he's conquered to keep that connection to to kind of not just overthrow and kill everyone to kind of have that connection to the past to make it easier to transition to if someone he, who he can control to transition into the future something i forget exactly what it was mm-hmm. but that would be true of all the other scions right so either sorvi in and of himself is important or sakarpus is important for some reason and um, i think the 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 supply chain argument might be a bit stale at this point so i'd like to know what else is going on there Let's see yeah i don't know yeah So any any other significant quotes that you guys want to bring up or any other topics? Okay, then in that case, uh, we'll see everyone next week. We haven't decided how many chapters. I think we'll probably be the next two because they are pretty long. But um yeah, either two or three chapters for next week. Thank you so much for listening everyone. We'll see you soon. Bye.